Okay. Thank you very much. So, hi. Switch to the board. So there was one issue I have not, no, not paid sufficient attention so far. And again, I would like to start with an example. Okay. So uh, it is degree four surfaces in P5. This will give us an example. And at least the smooth ones have been well known classically. So you can start with P2. And then you can embed it into P5 by the family of conics. So that, that would be, is frequently called the Veronese surface in P5. So this, this has degree 4. And so another example of these surfaces, you take P1 cross P1, but you embed it by a linear system that has degree 1 on one factor and degree 2 on the other factor. Okay. So then this way, you also get a surface that sits inside P5 and again has degree 4. And I'm interested in what are the hyperplane sections of it. Well, if you look at the hyperplane section of it, that will be just a conic. So then this V contains, well, degree 4 rational curve in P4. So it's sort of C4. It's a degree 4 rational normal curve in P4. That's sort of the smallest degree that a curve can be that actually sort of spans C4. And then if you look at the hyperplane section there, it's again a section of a linear system. And one of the projections shows that it's again a rational curve. And it's again degree 4. So that means this surface S, this also contains this, this C4 as uh, one of its hyperplane sections. And now, actually, one of the deformations I, I uh, wrote down before, it tells you that any surface, it can be deformed to a cone o over its hyperplane section. Yeah? So, so if you, you th think about that something sits inside, uh, say, say, P5 in this case, and then you intersect it with this with this P4, and you e imagine that maybe this is the coordinate x0 equals 0. And then you, I think, I think start the deformation with x0, x5 maps to t times x0, it's an x1, and it's an x5. So it's an identity here. But in the limit t equals 0, the limit just becomes the cone over this intersection. Okay, And so that means that there are these two deformations. So there is this V, and it deforms to just the cone over this C4. And this S is also deforms to a cone over C4. So you can write down one of these, of these families, families of, of surfaces where this sits over a special point and over general points, you get just copies of these. And then you can do the same thing here. Now, now you see, uh, see the two sides here, they are smooth. Now, uh, what kind of singularities is that surface has? Well, it's a cone. It has only one singularity. And the singularity is exactly when you take C4 and you, you quotient it out by the action that sends x to, to nope, 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 nope. There are several things wrong with this. First of all, is dimension. OK, so it's C2, and you send xy to ix and iy. OK? And so it's an order. There are four group. And then this was one of the, of the example one. The, so, 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 so I told you that quotient singularities, we like them. So that means that it's a singularity that's allowed. And now, uh, what is the basic invariant we have for various surfaces? Well, well we have the self-intersection of, of the canonical class. And of course, if you compute kv v squared, that is the same as k p2 squared, and that will be 9. And if you compute ks squared, that is just k p1 cross p1 
squared, and that is 8. Okay? So, now, you, you may entertain yourself by computing that, that the self-intersection of this, cone squared, this is also 9. Okay? And so, now, since a basic invariant variant was a self-intersection of, of, of the canonical class, then it seemed that sort of this deformation is OK. We are reasonably happy with it, I mean, as far as the self-intersection is concerned. But this side is a bad deformation somehow. And so that means this should be disallowed. OK? So uh, now, uh, you sort of may complain that in these examples, the canonical classes are not ample, and that's true, but for instance, you can write down some ramified double covers of these, so make sure that it does not ramify at exactly the, 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 the vertex. And you get some similar examples where all the canonical classes are ample, and the self-intersection of the canonical class is constant here, and the self-intersection of the canonical class jump here. If it's a double cover, there will be a jump of two all, all together. Okay? So, and so uh, that means that somehow we have to, to uh, understand sort of which are the good deformations on the left-hand side and which are the bad deformations they see on the right-hand side. Okay? And now, uh, so um, what's the, 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 the property that comes into to sort of action here? Well, um, and so, um, so maybe let's just focus on the right-hand side, OK? So I think if you want to understand what happens here topologically, so, so maybe here I have the cone, okay, and then here in the general fiber I have this, okay. And now let's write down some representatives of the canonical class. So, so, uh, yeah, I think that easiest to do the canonical cal class can be can be represented by sort of two lines in one direction. If you think about it as P1 cross P1, then it's, then it's this. OK. Now, what happens under degeneration? So, so maybe I shouldn't have made this completely symmetrical, because you see that, that in R embedding, the, maybe this direction, the line, are actual lines in P5, but in this direction, they become conics. Okay. So that means when they degenerate, of course, the lines degenerate to lines. But the other is the conic, they degenerate to a pair of lines. So that means that in the limit, we get one, two, three, four, five, six of these. OK, so that means there will be this nice degeneration. And now, if you want to understand topologically, the problem is that, 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 that so here I have something smooth. So, so that, that, that means that the second homology class, you can really think about it as a second cohomology class. And also here, well, there's a quotient singularity the, that at least with rational coefficients, you can think about homology class of this six line as a cohomology class. But on the total space, there is no second cohomology class which restricts to this one here and this one here. Okay? And so, so the fiber wise, you can 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 represent the homology class as the cohomology class, but you cannot do this over the total space. Yeah? Now, if you could do this over the total space, then of course the intersection number, self-intersection number is just constant. Yeah? Uh, because then there's a class on the total space, and the square of this uh, uh, intersected with this homology class, and that's invariant under the their deformation. So there is a basic topological obstruction here that, that, uh, th th that we need to, to understand. Okay? And so now then, uh, let's see. So maybe the theorem, which for surfaces, goes back to myself and Shepard Baron. 
Baron and, and the general case that was done, done sort of more recently. Okay, so um, so let's assume that I have uh, maybe it's over the unit disk or or, or over a smooth curve. Uh, actually, it's probably better if I use it over over where where. A very smooth curve. So this morphism is flat and projective. Uh, and I assume that the fibers are all all so stable stable varieties. Okay. And so that means that I know that the, the, the fibers are exactly the kind of varieties that I want. So they have this restricted class of singularities, log canonical singularities, and the canonical class example. And so uh, the, then the first, con first claim is that, that if you look at the fibers, xb, and you compute the self-intersection, that this is an upper semi-continuous function on b. And you see, like here, the self-intersection can jump from 8 to 9. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and then the second claim is that if, if this function is constant, well, this holds if and only if, well, there is a, well, so there, there is a, well, let me say, so this is not quite right. There's a Cartier divisor. So then the canonical class of X exists as a Cartier divisor. So to be sort of more precise, a multiple of it is, 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 is Cartier. So this means that it, that, that, that is the first chunk uh, that comes out of a line bundle, the chunk class of a line bundle at, 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 at least some multiple, yeah? So, so, so maybe this is, that's sort of a rational coefficient. It's a, 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 a Cartier divisor. Okay, so then sort of this will, will be the answer that, that sort of if there is sort of no numerical obstruction to what's happening, uh, then in fact the situation is, is, is nice that there is a Cartier divisor well, the whose restriction to every fiber naturally is just this, this k of x b. Okay, so that, that means that then we have a really nice family of divisors, and so the self intersection is necessarily the, the same. Okay. Uh, let's see how can we can we prove this. Well, so so. Uh, for the proof, let's assume just for simplicity that that sort of there is only one point in question, and the fibers are in fact smooth elsewhere. Okay, and so uh, so then we have some picture like this that there is a possibly rather bad fiber, and here and here then there are some nice fibers. Now, what sort of usually the, the try to do is to take a resolution of singularities and sort of see what happens, okay? So then we, then we just resolve the singularities. So then well, these fibers, they stay smooth. And now here, well, so here at least the irreducible components themselves are smooth. So here the general fiber is maybe x, xb. Okay, the special fiber is x sub zero. Now there will be this one irreducible simple component which just is just x zero bar, and there will be the other irreducible component. Just let me call them E. Okay. And now, well, so so then maybe let's call this x, and maybe this is just that is just x bar. Okay. Now, uh, well, so. Now, the, I know for sure that the canonical class of x bar that exists, because here I have something smooth, okay? And so, 
that I know that if I restrict this to the xt, that's just the canonical class of xt. Okay. And now the question is, well, what happens when I restrict it to the central fiber? Okay. And so, well, sort of the problem is that that uh, maybe I have some control over what happens over this x0 bar, but I have not much control what happens elsewhere. Okay. But but sort of let's see just just to see see what happens. So I can look at the so you know I, I would like to restrict to, to x0 bar, but of course what rest, restricts nicely it is not just the canonical class, but the canonical class if I add to it x0 bar, okay? So if I look at kx0 bar, that will be just the k, that's this curly x bar, plus x0 bar, the whole thing restricted to x0 bar, okay? And now, well, so of course, as sort of usual, there is a, there is a problem, and I want to restrict, restrict something just just to itself, I have to understand the normal bundle, but here I can actually rewrite it easily because I have the whole fiber, which is x0 bar plus e, and that is numerically really trivial. So, so, so this whole fiber is the same as xt, which does not restrict. So that means that I can, I, that I can rewrite it as the k x bar minus this e is restricted to x0 bar. And so now that is better, okay? Uh, but the problem is that I, I sort of don't have too much control over this e, okay? And uh, it's exactly e in situations like this that, that the minimal model the program can help us, uh, that, it can, that it can choose some particular partial resolution uh, where, where some things are, are under control. Okay? And so here then the special form that I need, it's, it's, uh, 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 it's uh, called the log canonical model. Okay? And so what I do here is I sort of Instead of trying to make this x0 bar as nice as possible, I sort of try to make sure that I'm sorry. And so, so I'm just trying to make sure that this x bar and the divisor x0 bar plus e is as nice as possible. And so how how nice can I make it? Well, there will be sort of sort of Two condition that this will be log canonical. Okay, and so that's that's nice. I can make it actually slightly better. So, 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 so technically, I will need something slightly different, but, but sort of that's fine. Fine, a low low canonical. And now then, well, I need that. So you know, sort of normally, if you have some variety, you can run the minimum of the program. You can achieve that the canonical class is simple. But here, sometimes it's better if you interact with some other divisor, and you can achieve that the kx bar plus x0 bar plus e is, yeah, I haven't given a name to this. OK, let's, what should I call it? Maybe let's call this, uh, let's call this maybe f, OK. Yeah. Is f ample. And so that means that, the, that it has positive. Uh, the, 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 the positive on well, maybe every fiber of f. Okay, let's just just uh, say this. Okay, and so let's see. Yeah. Okay, let's see now what happens. Um, and now, um, yes. So then, sort of what I want to do here, that now I just can't. Continue from here. So with this setting, this kx bar plus x0 bar plus e, okay, this restricted to x0 bar, and the minus I will have this e restricted to, to x0 bar. Okay. And now let's see what happens. 
Uh, and now, at least what I gain, that this is something that's relatively ample. So that's relatively ample. And then, well, this E actually is, is effective. And here, this E will contain every divisor there with coefficient 1. So this is all divisors, all exceptional divisors. with coefficient 1. OK, and so now then let's try to, to understand. Well, so of course I have this map x0 bar that comes down to x0. OK, so well, how can I r understand the kx0 bar? So maybe this is just the map f0. It's just f0 up per star, the kx0. And then plus, uh, here I have something that I usually denoted that, that is analog of, of the Jacobian idea. Okay? Now, what was the definition of log canonical? The definition of log canonical was that in this, I pick up at most simple poles. So that means that everything in j appears with coefficient larger or equal minus 1. Okay, so the the log canonical condition says, well, let me just write it at j larger or equal minus 1. So by this, I mean that every divisor appears in it with, with coefficient larger or equal well, minus 1. OK. And so now then this tells me that I have another f f formula here that I have this is something ample minus this e restricted to x0 bar. OK? So now, of course, this one is numerically trivial. So then if I just focus on the part that comes out of that, 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 that just uh, what happens with the fibers, then I get that, that ample equals, that will be j plus e. OK, now what happens here? Well, the j is larger or equal minus 1. And in this e, everything appears exactly with coefficient larger or equal 1, with coefficient exactly 1. So I know that here everything appears with coefficient larger or equal 0. Ah, but this is actually, this actually cannot happen. Why? Because the exceptional divisors, they have, uh, they have negative self-intersection. Yeah? I mean, in the most classical case, in the surface case, I know that the intersection matrix is even negative definite. And so that if I have something that's effective, then it has negative intersection with things. It cannot be ample. Okay? So that means that, 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 this, is, that so this cannot happen. Well, so to be the only way out of it is that, in fact, this e is just 0, and then this j just has its negative part. OK? So, and, and so then the conclusion is that this e, in fact, has to be 0, and uh, it's empty, which is nice. In this resolution, this, all these other exceptional divisors, they did not happen. OK? So then. So, 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 so here I have my original picture. Here I have this complicated x0. And now here I just have this nice x0 bar. Now this is not quite smooth, yes? Yeah? So, so there is some price to, price to pay for this low canonicity that, you know, to, that, that to start with, I just started, you know, and I could resolve everything, but then if I wanted, to get some ampleness, some singularities come in, but I still know that this is log canonical. Okay, and so now then I would like to compare to to to, to compare the self intersections. Okay, so and and so then then uh, my so then what I would like to know that if I have kx zero to the n would like to prove that this is larger or equal this k x b. Well, I suppose I denoted x t usually maybe x b. 
kxb to the n. OK. Well, so what do I know? Well, um, now, then instead, it seems hard to use just the self intersection here. But, but, but you know that if there is an ample divisor, OK, then the self intersection of it is the, is the leading term of the of its Hilbert Bert polynomial. So that means that instead of instead of 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 proving this, I can can think of them trying to to to, to, to understand asymptotically that H zero of X zero some large multiple of M K X zero and I want to prove this is larger or equal than the H zero uh, X B uh, M times Kxb, I would like to prove this for m, m sufficiently large. OK, now, and so now I can put this in because for cohomology I have upper semi-continuity, m times kx0. OK, so then, he, then he, this is just a normal upper uh, semi-continuity for the cohomology. And now what happens between them? But you see that I told you that J has to be entirely negative for this ampleness to work. And so that means that the canonical class of X0 bar, I get it by pulling back the canonical class and subtracting sec something. So that means I can only lose sections under this process. Okay? So, so that means I definitely have this and I have the inequality. Okay? And so then I have the upper semi-continuity. Now what about the second part? Well, um, and so uh, it is actually, I just need to understand what happens here. So, so it is not hard to believe that, that so, so you see that if I just pull back and I subtract something, but then I lose. I lose the sum sections, and it's sort of not hard to uh, hard to show in this case. But in general, it was a so we, we, we sort of worked out with, with 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 so it was a a paper with Fulger, myself, and Lehman, uh, and that that. The, 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 so very generally, every time you are subtracting something, you in fact decrease the self-intersection. And so, so you see that if you lose section, it just means that in the H zeros there is a strict inequality. But so, but here we are taking the limit essentially, and so it's not clear that if I have strict inequality here, that implies a strict inequality there. But but in fact, something like this, 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 this works out. OK, so, so sort of this, is, this is your one part. Uh, now, then I would also like to understand this at the level of, of you know, the singularities. And, and, and there's something thing that I find that I find very interesting, but I can't. But I can't put all the pieces together yet, so I hope that someone can can help me. Okay, so um, uh, so now, now I would like to to now do the the following that that you know, for instance I start with one of my varieties, which let's assume it just has an isolated singularity, okay, that that log canonical. And so then the complement of this is u, okay? And then I, 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 I would like to understand the deformations of x by first describing the deformations of u, and then see when they, they extend to a deformation of x that has certain property. Okay, so, uh, well, so if I have something u that is smooth, yeah? Then the deformations they are just all locally trivial. Okay, so if I start with something, say, say an open set, set, set V. Okay, 
then then so, 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 so maybe the ring of of functions on some you know, coordinate chart is just r then on a first order deformations the ring of functions will be just r epsilon where i just set epsilon squared equals 0 so sort of you imagine try to write down the taylor series but you stop at at, at, at step 1 now then so the, what is Kodaira and Spencer sir, saying here? Well, so we need to understand the automorphisms of it. And then and the automorphisms of it of the form R of the form, R1 plus epsilon R2, you can map. Yeah, so so I, I would like to understand automorphisms that are trivial on R. So just change on the second one. So that's R1 plus epsilon times. And that says VR1 plus R2 where this v is just a derivation. So, so that if this corresponds to some open f fine, fine chart, say, say uh, maybe just v, an algebraic variety, then, then this will be just a section of the tangent bundle of it. Okay. And so now then, OK, then how to? to understand the deformations of just a smooth variety. Well, so if I have u smooth, and I look at the first order deformation, then, then Coder Spencer says that I cover it with some open f fine, fine chars, all of which have a trivial deformation. So then if I deform it, I get just the ui epsilon. And now then what happens that over the intersection, ui intersect uj, uh, 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 I have, uh, from restricting to ui and from uj, I have sort of two different and, uh, v v v way of representing this trivially. So the difference is precisely just an automorphism. And so, so that means that patching is done by the, but a zero, u i j, and so, the, so then the tangent, and then that's all together. This gives you an element in the first cohomology group of u. T restricted to you. Okay, so then these are the spaces of the first order deformations. Okay, now. Uh, We will be interested in, in uh, OK, so let's assume now that I have a function. Uh, so f is just a f function. Maybe let's call it. OK, no, let's call it f. f is a function on u. And then I would like to know whether it lifts to the first order deformation. Well, so then, oh, of course, f restricted to ui. I can just, well, it has various lifts, gi, OK? And so when this lift. Now, so when will this give me an actually globally well-defined lift? Well, the, this will be a globally well-defined This precisely when gi minus gj is just this vij acted on f, OK? So, so now then. Then what is this? Well, this is, is, this is in H1 of, of u, t, u. And then this is in H0 of u, o, u. And then if I do this operation, I just mapping, of course, to H1 of u, o, u. OK? And then this is precisely the condition that the cohomology class I get is 0. OK? So the function lifts precisely when when, so the gives me the deformation, this gives me the function, and the, the function will lift the deformation precisely when I map to 0 here. OK. Now, of course, I'm also interested in omega, yeah? that I would like to understand the lifting of the sections of omega. So what happens then if I have some typical typical end form line like this, and I apply the automorphism. Well, so the, then if I have this automorphism, 
that of course what happens then the xi is mapped to xi plus this vxi, okay? So maybe let's write the v is sum of vi times d uh, dxi, okay? And so then I know that dx, sorry, maybe let's put it here, okay? So dx1 vash dxn, then it's under the automorphism maps to d of xi plus, and then here I get the sum of vj times, uh, oh, oh, okay, so when I apply this to xi, then of course only, only vi survives, so that will be, will be d of, of vi, which of course will be the sum of dvi dxj dxj, okay? And then I can have the d's of this, xn plus here I have the sum of d v n d x j d x j now oh, of course when I wedge these these together out of this complicated the the, the, the ah you no know, no no this is the big thing that I have these epsilons, epsilons in front of them yeah and so the epsilon square is zero yeah so when I wedge all of these, these together, if I have at least two from these complicated tails, I get zero. And so the only way I get something non-zero, well, I have the first term, which is just dx1 versus dxn. And then for epsilon times, I have to pick something from here, but then from the others, I have to pick dx2 and so on dxn. That means that the only term that survives here is the one that has dx1. And so that means that I get that dx1 wedge dxn times and 1 plus epsilon times exactly the divergence of v with respect to the coordinate x. Okay, so this is exactly the formula that I get for, I get for here what happens with sections. Okay, and so... And so now then, well, so let's work locally. You see, so one of, of my conditions was that, you know, locally, the dualizing shift is something like trivial, or at least the power of it is trivial, okay? So, so, uh, so that means, so if, if omega u to the n is trivial, so then I can take a section of it, omega u, u to the m, and then I, I can look at sort of, sort of, sort of when this section lifts, okay? And so now then the answer sir, to this is, well, exactly when, when sort of this object, well, so the, 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 and if I apply this to, to over the patches, then then uh, this, then you see the gradient with respect to sigma, then the vij, so sorry, not, not a gradient, the divergence of, with respect to sigma, the vij's, then still gives me, me a class of h1 of, one of u and ou, okay? So, and, th and then I get as before, the dissection will lift to a first order deformation precisely when this is zero. Now, well, well, how does this depend on sigma? So, oh, of course, instead of sigma, I could have chosen a function times sigma and over zero, where zero function. And so then what happens there? Then you see that here, that so here I would have to put in an S, and, that, and then here I would have an S plus epsilon uh, times V of S, okay? And so then if you chase through these formulas, then you can get this S here, and then what I have to add to it, that is this epsilon times the V of S mod S. So there is this extra 
Durham comes in. And so, so then this means that here then this divergence, I have to change it to, to V of, sorry, so to the Vij of S mod S plus the gradient with respect to sigma Vij. Okay. Ah, but you see what I have here. But here I have a function. And now if I'm looking at the deformation, I like the function's lift. That means that this is, in fact, a trivial cohomology class as I compute it. Okay? And so, so that this means I get that, that there's a well defined notion of divergence which goes from the H1 of U T U to the H1 of U O, -O U such that omega extends at least to first order if and only if, so then if I take a, a deformation here, then I can take the divergence of D and this has to be zero. So this is the condition that, is, that the omega as a sheath lifts, okay? Now, so I hope that, so that this computation and my previous work can be united because, of course, when you hear divergence zero, it exactly means that the vector field does not does not change the local volume. Yeah, that is local volume preserving. Now, of course, here it's somehow it's a cohomology class that I'm I'm computing. So this is not sort of sort of some normal divergence. It's some cohomology class, but it's but but so I really hope that. That sort of this formula uh, will then give a local proof that they exactly have to be have to be the volume preserving deformation. So that's exactly what came out of the global arguments before. That now this will give me a local proof that that this works. So at least it's sort of very uh, very tempting to me. Okay, so now, now, uh, but, but sort of the, uh, the other thing is that you see that these formulas you can actually really, really uh, write down in some concrete, concrete cases. So if you want to understand, say, so the, okay, so there is a seemingly, seemingly completely stupid example. Okay, so when x will be c two. And u will be c to minus the origin. Okay. Okay. Now, of course, you might say you are not particularly interested in deformations of c two because we know that they are trivial. Okay. But so, so what's the deformation so the theory of u here? Well, so then the well, so the, so the first computation is that h one of u o u, and this has sort of a basis is one over x to the i, y to the j, where i, j larger or equal 1, okay? So that means h1 is infinite dimensional. That's already, already nice. And then you can write down the, down the h1 of, sorry, u of t u. And so, so that will be, oh, okay, so maybe it's better to write it as, Okay, so I think if you want to work really homogeneous, then sort of like this, x to the i, y to the j, and y times dy, x to the i, y to the j, and, and now the only problem is the conditions are that after canceling the x, the denominator still has both y and j. So, so i at least 2, j at least 1, and here i at least 1, and j at least 2, okay? And then, and if you use these coordinates, okay, then, then this divergence is just the usual divergence in, 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 in the standard coordinate. So, 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 so we just get the usual divergence. Okay, and so the, the, that means you can really compute very explicitly what's going on. Now, of course, uh, again, I say that, that you see, maybe, 
we, you are sort of not particularly interested in this. But uh, now let's see what happens if I have just some, some quotient singularity. And let's assume, just for, sim for simplicity, for, for, for computation <coughs> now, that I act with some cyclic group and with something like x, y goes to maybe x epsilon to the i times y, where epsilon is a primitive mth root of unity. Okay. Now, the, the, the point is that if the, the, the map that comes from C2 to here, well, that's a complicated map because that ramifies at, at the origin. But, but the map from u to u mod mu m that is an unramified map, okay? And so that means that, that means that the functions here are just the invariant functions. Well, that's okay before, but more importantly, that the tangent space nothing happens there. The the, the, the h1 of the tangent space it is just the invariant part of it. So that means you can run these these formulas to understand the deformation spaces of these quotient singularities. Any given case. It's very easy to write down by hand completely what happens. So there are some explicit formulas. They, are, they tend to be a little bit messy because there are some so I don't know, kind of coincidences sort of here and there. But, but, but it means you can really c c completely understand stand what happens, at least with first order deformations of, of quotient singularities. And, and so, so at least some old conjectures were laid to, to rest by this example. So, 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 so this, is a, this is a joint work with Klaus Altman. And maybe I have enough time for other things. So, so the, this, this happens for, 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 for surfaces. And now... Then my some of my claim is that that whatever happens in higher co-dimension, that that sort of their uh, their things are actually much easier. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. So, yeah, I think I either stop now or I go at least 10 minutes over, I think. And so if people want to sleep for 10 minutes, for 20 minutes, that may be good, but. Okay, well, no, I mean, what the. Huh? Can you go 15 minutes? Five minutes over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if maybe I talk very fast, okay. then, I can, then I can finish it on time. Okay, okay. So, um, so, um, so, uh, what is the sheaf theoretic problem? Then, then, sort of that we have. Okay, so, so. So then, again, let's assume that I have my, my x0, and maybe, and so, so then here I have this x, and here I have this special fiber x0. And, uh, and so, the, the, you see, the problem then, then was that, for instance, I know that omega x0 to the m is locally free, and I know that omega xt to the m is also locally free. But somehow they don't want to glue together into a nice local leaf free family. And so, so that I do have an object, omega x to the m, on the total space. But then I restrict it to x0, this maps to omega x0 to the m, but this map is not surjective. Uh, so so to, or the problem is this is not surjective. Uh, 
And so you see, if it's subjective, then Nakayama lemma tells you that this is also locally free. So, so that is really the, the question is only the sort of this map. And now, in studying the, 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 the deformations of, of these, there were sort of two approaches here. And so sort of one was the, which, I think usually called the feedback way, feedback, sorry, feedback definition, that says that that this is surjective for some m larger than zero, and so, so, so the one I champion is that this sh there should be surjective for every m. Okay, that so, so they all nicely. The fit together, and 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 for, for a long time we had a we had difficulty understanding the relationship between these two notions. And so, what I would like to to now explain it's a, a, a proof so of the, the the outcome of the of the computation with this two-dimensional quotient singularities is that these two notions, they are indeed different for two-dimensional uh, quotient singularities. So these are indeed different in, in dimension. But now what I would like to prove is that sort of by contract, contract, these two notions are the same in higher dimensions. Okay? And so what I would like to prove that that if I have this set up, so, uh, I, so if uh, this omega x to the m to, sorry, to omega x0 to the m is, is surjective outside a co-dimension 3 set plus surjective for some m larger than zero, then it's in fact surjective. Okay, that so the, 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 there's really this co-dimension mention two problem um, is indeed very different from what happened in higher dimension. Okay, so so well. Um, so uh, and, uh, in sort of general, I can sort of start with, so, so don't need omega. I can sort of start with sort of any, any L. So this omega, it can be replaced by, by some any L, L for now. And then at the end, I have to switch back to omega. But you will see where it, it, it comes from. So, 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 so that if I have this, this uh, this x and I know that this l to the m is m is locally free. Okay, uh, it is uh, it, it is very easy is the reduction to assume that this l to the n m is ample. So that means I can assume it has a nice global section, and then I can t take the m's root out of it. So then this x will be replaced by something y, which is just an m-sheeted covering of this that, that ramifies along this, this section. And then the main thing that I need, that it's easy to compute, that if you look at the pi lower tar, tar of the structure sheaf of y, that will be sum from 0 to m minus 1 e l to the minus i. OK, so that's just a, so, so the very easy z. The computation, and now, and now, I would like to understand uh, here what happens with y. Okay, so uh, somehow, somehow, I would like to understand how the cohomology of the of the structure sheaf sheaf here changes, and there is this very nice argument here. So now here I have this y zero, okay. And so uh, then I'm hoping to prove that, uh, that you know, if you look at the HI, 
of y0, this O y0. And then maybe let's take an infinitesimal thickening of it. Okay, so 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 that means that H I Y maybe uh, so to thicken to order R, okay, O Y R. And then there's a natural map here. And you see the general cohomology and base change 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 theorem says I think yeah, I think maybe here this is the growth and the, the version that sort of that, that if I vary the fibers that these are locally constant, if and only if sort of these maps are all surjective. Okay, so then I just uh, then I just need to understand this. So now, well, of course I can look at look, look at here cohomology with coefficient c. Okay. Well, I mean, any constant function is holomorphic, so I have natural real maps here. And now you see, as far as the constant sheaf is concerned, that, that does not see, see the nil potents. Okay? So that these two are the same. So that means that, that if I knew that this map was subjective, Okay, then I could go around this way, then I get the surjectivity. Now, if this y0 is smooth, then it's Hodge theory that tells me that this is, is surjective. And now, there's, there's a singular notion of it, it's called Dubois singularity, which, which pretty much says that this has to be, to be subjective if it has Dubois singularity. And I proved it with Chandor Kovac that low canonical singularities are the ball. Okay? And so uh, that means that I have this surjectivity. Now then the question is well, how much of it do I need actually for particular values? I'm, I'm especially interested in, in sort of the larger, larger ones. So, so if the dimension is that I'm interested in, in n minus 1, O y 0, and H n y 0, O y 0, OK? And now you see, so, so what do I have here? So th th there is this, this problem that, that so on this fiber, where there's a co-dimension 3 set, where these L's don't exactly do what I expect them to do. Yeah? That the, the things are not Cartier, that's a little bit out of control. That is a co-dimension three set that is out of, of, of my control. But if I change Y0 just on a co-dimension three set, then it does not change the two highest cohomologies. Okay? So, the, the, and so this means that this difficulty that I have in in the highest, in, 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 in co-dimension 3, will not affect sort of these, uh, these two groups, OK? And now, then if you again look at sort of, uh, sort of semi-continuity, then sort of well, you need the subjectivity here, but then you get that, that sort of then these groups, groups are OK. And so, so, and so then the conclusion is that I get that Rn F lower star Oy, sorry, Oy is locally free. Okay, so this is the nicest thing that can happen. And uh, now there is a simplest duality that I know that sort of you know that F lower star, the sheaf hum of well if I have an arbitrary sheaf f. So, sorry, I think I will have just, just maybe. Okay, so, well, okay, so duality says that this goes to the omega y over the base. This is the same as the home, sheaf home over the base, Rn, f lower star f, and just O of the base. So now, I apply this for Oy. 
I know that this is locally free, so that means that this thing I get here is locally free, and it commutes with base change. So, and now, of course, if this is just O, then this is just omega, so then I get that F lower star is omega y over b is locally free and commutes with base change. And, but now, what will this be? Well, so, so you see that the push forward of OY of this, so then you see that the push forward of omega of y, y, so maybe probably I should do it over the base. Over the base is just the sum against 0 to m minus 1. That will be that omega x over the base tends with l to the i. And here I. Need the double dual of these tensor products. Okay, so ah, but you see the fact that this map, sorry, that I have surjective, it exactly means that 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 these sheaves that the sheaves commute with base change. Okay, so that means that I get that that get all of these sheaves. I can use it for larger and larger amps, then you know all of these these sheaves commute with base change. And so now you see that if, that if I work with an arbitrary L, then it's interesting that I needed that you know, L to the M is locally free for some M. And then instead of getting some information about the powers of L, I get some information you know, about omega X tensor or the powers of L. But if L E, e, is in fact omega, then, then it gives me information about all the powers of omega. Okay? So I so still don't know why this doesn't work for arbitrary L, whether, whether you, you just need to write down, the, down duality differently. But, okay, and only two and there. It's only three minutes. Okay, thank you. Questions? This technique you, you described for computing deformations of quotient singularities? Um, yes. Can, can it be applied to other cones? Or to other co and so, so uh, yes, I mean, mm -hmm. so the principle it applies to anything if you have a sort of reasonably good understanding of, of the smooth set. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's a it's sort of. So maybe you have to be lucky, but you see. So for C two minus the origin, it has an infinite dimensional deformation space, and so you would think that that you know, I mean, this is just bad because you you got too much. But but uh, the coordinates are are so nice there that. The, at the end, everything becomes simpler in that infinite dimensional space. So, somehow that's the nice. Uh, before that, I tried to work in the finite dimensional deformation space of the quotient singularity itself, and that doesn't seem to have such nice coordinates. I always got lost. And it was Klaus Altman who told me that I should work in this infinite dimensional space, and then. Some of things actually work out, out much better. But if you have some similarly good under the standing of this open set, then I think these, these computations really might be simpler. Well, let's thank Janos for that nice